Well, for the very few people that don't know David, but I know there's a few of you, so I'll go to something more practical. But um, David lives in Florida, and he comes to visit us now and again. He uh, was a photographer, professional photographer, working, teaching at Yale when um, his infant son was extremely ill, and he had a dream to come to Virginia Beach and met with Paul, and Paul gave him a reading that saved his son's life. And after that, I don't know how long after that, he came to work with Paul for a couple of years and traveled teaching inner light consciousness and dream workshops for the church. And then he went and got a psychology degree, and he has now spent 20 plus years in service as being a school psychologist and special ed teacher. But for us, he, um, well I should say, those special ed kids were very lucky because uh, he was so successful with them because of his ability to love them exactly how they are. And yesterday I was thinking that myself, was that David loves me just the way I am. What a gift that is. And so he comes up here to uh, care for us by helping us with the inner light consciousness and giving Akashic Record readings for those that want them. And I can see by the people in the audience, there are a number of you that have had that experience. So you know what I speak of. And so as you listen to him today, listen for him loving you just the way you are. David. Well, I had to produce a topic for you, and I want to thank Bernice Spencer and the Oneness Group who brought me here to speak on International Day of Peace. And I'm going to share some of that with you and share some other things, too. Before I begin, because I may live in Florida, but there's never a day I'm not here in spirit, literally. And many of you know, and for those who don't know, a year and a half ago, my wife was on a bicycle and hit by a car. We did seven months in the hospital, and I brought her home just a little more than a year ago. Well, since Labor Day, she has gone to the campus where she's a professor and met a class in international children's issues for three hours every Monday she's teaching again. And you, my brothers and sisters, had a prayer chain for her over and over, and I know it mattered. Thank you. This is a family. Still in a chair. She doesn't have all of her hands back, but her mind is 100%, and her heart just may be improved. <laughs> okay. All right, I promised to speak about Syria, peace, and prophecy. And when I chose that title, Mr. Putin had not emerged from the Kremlin with an extraordinary solution to that terrible dilemma. And whoever expected the ex head of the KGB to come up with a plan that may be practical to stop the tanks and the missiles. I would love to tell you we would heal that nation. I'm afraid it's too late. One third of their people, almost two million people, have fled. And there's no sign that the government at war with its own people is going to change <coughs> policy. But it has brought to all of us another Spectre, not one that I've thought about much since the days of Paul Salman, although he did talk about it, and that was the specter of Armageddon. Now, for those of you who were not steeped in the King James Version, as I was and Paul was, <laughs> that was to be the final battle of the world. And the name Armageddon really means on the plains of Megiddo, a real-life plane, you can see it from a tall building in Jerusalem, and the site of many a battle over the centuries. 
And in fact, Paul did some prophecy readings in which he described what that battle would be like. Yes, it would start with tanks and planes and progress to missiles and end with nuclear war that would engulf the entire world. And he made that prophecy several times. If you read those readings in their entirety, I wish more people would read readings in their entirety. <laughs> he said, this is what it would be like if we can't let go of our selfish purposes. This is what it will be like if we put our faith in geopolitics to keep us safe. Well, golly, in this congregation, I think we all know that. Um, he made other prophecies about it. And in one of his lesser known readings, he described a meeting, a meeting by chance that he had with Anwar Sibdant, the then president of Egypt. Paul went out to the pyramids as a sightseer. David Solomon was with him and some others. And and walked up to a little college, a cottage, not a college, behind a fence, sat almost on the pyramid grounds, and a man came out, he was tending to the flowers, and he introduced himself. That was Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt. And he was being a politician and pressing the flesh, and he looked at Paul and he said, do you know who I am? And Paul said, yes, you are Esau. Esau was the brother of Jacob, I believe I have that correctly. And Paul said, you'll bring peace to Jerusalem. And Anwar Sadat said, yes, I am the brother of Esau. And Paul understood that he meant he was the reincarnation of Esau. That was the exchange that they had. There wasn't a lot more to that exchange, but Paul came away believing after that meeting it wasn't going to be an Armageddon on the plains outside of Jerusalem. But Esau had returned. And although it wasn't perfect, set in motion with Menachem Begin, initiatives that would forestall, and I can't even remember now how many wars there have been since that year of 1978. I believe we have not only forestalled it again. I believe we've seen a precedent-setting initiative. A president of Russia has stepped forth with what appears to be an unselfish recommendation. For Syria is their property and Assad is their man. Well, Lord, all the great nations of the Lord, of the world, have retained you in their really bad people in charge of governments in order to maintain control of those places. And we've had our men, too, in Vietnam and other places. I lost the thread there for a minute, because I don't want to go into a lot of detail about Syria. I want to say something else instead. I believe, and most of us now believe, after only 10 or 12 days, since this initiative has come forth, that we are going to muddle through, got the thread again. And this precedent will change the way we handle crises of this kind henceforth. You can tie the Security Council of the United Nations in a knot, but you can't tie God in a knot. And I believe that just as we meet our lessons, the great leaders of this world, need their lessons too. And truly a man I've loved and trusted from a distance to leave this country came up with a pretty bad idea a while back because he drew a line in the sand and somebody crossed it. And then he felt he had to make good on that threat and just about everybody in his party and in the other party and in the nation and in the world said we're not buying in this time. And I think his plans have had to change. Now, I'm sorry he went through that pain, but I'm not sorry that his plans have changed. Well, I want to suggest something else. We cannot restore the state of Syria. And I fear we have, the world has, permitted, not attending to a long-standing problem, 
another huge body of refugees who will never probably in their lifetimes return to this nation. And I hope we help them effectively, more effectively than we've helped other refugees in the past. But right now, I want to focus on what we've really been sharing here. Angela shared it, and Bruce shared it, and it was shared in music as well. There is a land, a large piece of earth, that has been torn and needs healing. And that is that land we call Syria. I know it's politically foolish to say, let's pray for that land, but that's what I want to suggest to you. Let's pray that the healing and restorative powers of that earth, those mountains, be restored. I believe very much we are in a reciprocal eye-to-eye -eye relationship with the earth. I also believe that in our time we've avoided the great ecological disasters that we used to fear and call earth changes. Somehow consciousness has been raised. I also believe, and I have scolded this congregation before, <laughs> that the young people of this earth, 20 and under, have appeared here with a new set of beliefs and a new kind of energy, and we want to support them every way we can, even though in the short run, as always with the younger generation, it may look like chaos. And sometimes it does, especially when it gets personal. I did a reading in May, <clears throat> and I'm going to quote from it, forgive me. For a woman in her 40s who has a daughter, just turned 20, who has consciously and deliberately and planfully set out to start a family without a spouse, and has no plans to marry that baby daddy. We have baby daddies now, don't we? Some of them are famous and rich. <laughs> well, I'm not sure it's the best idea we ever had, but perhaps the earth will work out with it. But that was her concern. Here's the way part of this reading went. This woman is a healer. She's from California. She does what's called Watsu healing in hot springs. The reading said to her, the times have changed. Yes, this story can be read if you watch the movie Avatar and turn off the soundtrack, skip the combat. Look at the images of animal and plant and truly human life in total communication with each other. That is the lesson your generation has come to teach. Through wholeness, through healing, and through dissolving national racial and cultural boundaries. It's a long time since those boundaries have been real. Your generation's children will not tolerate these boundaries and these differences. They are dissolving them helter-skelter with the internet. They're not going to put up with visas, border crossings, limitations, passports, or wars for geopolitical purposes. The children we have on this planet at this time will not support those activities any longer. There has been a sea change in the purposes of the souls who have entered this earth in the last 25 years, and their numbers are building every day. Now, I know that many of you will remember what it was like in the 60s and in the 70s when we grabbed our signs and went into the streets. <laughs> My parents were appalled. They grew up in the Depression. They did their job in World War II. It never occurred to them to say to Franklin Roosevelt, we won't go. Well, it didn't occur to them that a son of theirs would say that either. Well, our sons and daughters will be saying things like that to us and our grandchildren too. 
And they will be saying, I'm a free woman. I can raise children and make my way and look eye to eye with any citizen in this country. I don't need the supports of marriage. I don't need the support of a community church. I may not even need the support of a conventional education. And my friends are going to be all over the globe and I'm going to talk with them on Facebook. And if I see an opportunity, I'm going to make it happen. If I have to go to Hong Kong to incorporate and come home, that's what I'm going to do. No one's going to stop me. That's already begun. More than begun. My own children, 19, 24, and 26, have traveled around the world with Nancy and I, and on their own as well, and I pulled them around the dining table before I came up here. How many of their friends that they talk to on Facebook live in other countries? These three young women write regularly to people in 21 countries. Those are their friends. Now, I know and you know, you can't cheer as the bombers depart to bomb a country where your friends are. There are refugees leaving Syria, and we see them on the news, and oh God, they look like all the refugees we've been seeing all our lives. But more and more, we know those people. We know their faces. And that's building and building and building. And we're past the point where a politician can stand up and say, those people aren't like us, they are evil. And we have to control them with our military, our weapons, but we have to rescue them from the clutches of our enemy, who is not like us. That's not true. Our enemy is exactly like us. His system may be a little different, but his people are not. His prayers of those people are not different from our prayers. I'm going to say one thing more about that under 20 generation. Speak more, this lady asked, about the work I'm doing. Am I going to be working with children? How do I attract those children, if that's the case? Well, let's look, I said. The first thing we see is a field of pink forming in the ethers about us in this moment. And then we see the females born in the last 20 years or so, give or take a few. Let us talk about how this wave of souls has prepared. First, they take a great deal for granted. They feel entitled, not just to peace, but to religious and personal and sexual freedom, although they will pursue it in their own way and they will not find raising children any easier than your generation has. They also feel entitled to power in this society. And it's that quality that you as a teacher will bring forth in them, for you were born a forerunner. I hear two things when I hear that. The first one is, these souls have prepared as a wave. And if I may, I'm not going to brag exactly, but just as we did. Okay. <laughs> we did step into the forefront. I'm not sure we ever could have filled Times Square with our numbers, but we made a difference. What you just heard, I've now heard in 25, 30, maybe 40 readings. As a wave of souls, we have done our work. And if you're in your 40s as a wave of souls, you have done your work too. And what is our work? We attracted those souls with this commitment. That work spans international boundaries. It spans all languages. It spans music and art and religion. We've done our job. Yes, there are nations left to heal. Yes, sadly, there will be more wars. I honestly, truly say to you, there will not be an Armageddon in our lifetimes. And it will not be in the Middle East, God forbid, it should ever come. That's what I believe. Paul Solomon said over and over and over that the purpose of a prophecy is to change it. 
Okay, now that is not going to satisfy the people who say, let's add up the score here. Was he 80% correct? Was he 85% correct? He didn't want to be correct. He wanted to make a difference. So much more important than being correct. I believe we've made a difference. I believe our children and our grandchildren will make a difference. Will we see peace? We do see peace every time we come to this sanctuary. We see peace every time we enter our own temples. And we spread that peace. I don't have to persuade you that a beautiful tree spreads peace. I know that you know. I don't have to persuade you that a breeze off the ocean spreads peace. We are no less important and no less powerful when the peace in our hearts goes out and spreads peace to the people we meet, to the people we forgive, to the people in the city where we live. Many of you probably know, all over the Far East there are stupas and domes and various kinds of temples that are made of solid masonry. There's no sanctuary there. They don't meet inside them. They're arranged in a roughly pyramidal shape, or teardrop shape, over Buddha's fingernail, <laughs> or the fingernail, the tip of some saint, or a few locks of hair. Why are they there? Because those people believe that that draws in power from the sky and literally radiates it through the earth for miles around. I believe that too. I have visited some of those temples in Burma, and it was a powerful experience, totally without words, totally alien to my concepts, which are being dissolved right and left. Um, I felt that power. And I think every one of us here has precisely the same power. When we read of a tragedy, when we read of a crime, when we turn on that television and see a bad thing that's happened to someone who looks just like us, and our emotions flow in that perfect prayer of empathy and sympathy, we're healing that earth, we're healing those persons, we're healing all those watching that broadcast in that moment who are touched too. Yes, there's plenty wrong with the world of broadcast, and there's plenty wrong with the world of media, but there's some things right. They're bringing us together. It is possible for us to know all over the world in an hour, not just of another school shooting, but also of a miracle. Wherever and whenever it occurs, we turn on YouTube, we see that little video that's viral at the moment of the vendor who rescues a boy who's been caught stealing painkiller from a shop. And the vendor pays for the painkiller and gives the boy a little plastic bag of soup. Time passes. The vendor's an old man and he goes into a hospital in Bangkok with a bad heart situation. And his daughter comes, prays for him in intensive care, puts a for sale sign up on the shop because the bill is immense. And the doctor comes in. I'm not going to cry. Where are you, Jill? Okay. The doctor comes in and says, <clears throat> this bill was paid 30 years ago. I was that boy. <clears throat> Our prayers go up when we see that. Now, there's no message, come to my church. <laughs> There's no cross. There's no mantra. It's just a message of <laughs> love that endures over time. And every love and gesture that we make endures over time, too. I am an old teacher. I've been teaching one way or another since 1968. YouTube and Facebook have brought me messages from students whose names I had forgotten. Students of every kind, students of writing, students of photography, students of dreams. We're linking up again. 
people I'd forgotten who I'm sure I never see again. And they tell me stories. When you did this, when you did that, it touched me. They are not the ones that I remember. It wasn't my fine ideas. It wasn't my great concept. I taught for a while at a school of art that was full of GIs just back from Vietnam. I guess I've heard from about seven of them over the last year, and they all mentioned the same event, a day when I, I did a demonstration of how to develop in a tray with a water bath first, develop film negatives, and cut the contrast, and uh, I put the developer in the water tray, and the water in the developer tray, and was totally skunked on these films, and everybody laughed and laughed and laughed. That's what they remember. <laughs> And what they say can be summarized this way. You were just like us in that moment. <laughs> and I was, of course. And oh God, I was red-faced. But it touched them. It touches me to remember them and remember that. We don't know when we touch people. I think we touch people when we are at our most human and not our most polished. Some of the best parent conferences as a school psychologist I've ever had. I, I got tired of this. But my office was in a tower above the elementary school. I don't know what that thing was up there for, but it was the office nobody wanted, so I got it. And I would go up there to certain parent conferences, and I confess, carrying a cup of coffee. And if on the way up those stairs I tripped and spilled the coffee on myself, I knew this conference was not going to be as I planned it. <laughs> that I needed to drop everything and really, really listen. There was something of another quality to give to those parents. I tried to honor those coffee spills. <laughs> uh, and I, I really believe you understand me when I say, you are light bearers. Yep, it can be as simple as a smile or a touch at the right moment, at any given moment. Right now in this sanctuary, there are people in pain. This is the place for them at this moment. They may never speak about where the pain is, but they've come to be healed by your touch, and there is nothing that I know of more healing than simple touch. Now, so you know my family has walked through a bit of a path for these last 18 months. And my daughter came home from South America where she was teaching and she's still home. And my middle daughter came home from Eckerd College where she was a resident advisor and she's still home. And my youngest daughter chose to turn down a tennis scholarship in Delaware and stay home. So once again I've been running a household with three young women for the last year. <laughs> and you know, they're not always kind. <laughs> As in, we are not eating that crap. Order a pizza. <laughs> because I have learned at the age of 69 how to cook. And I can now make a meal that would please them about four times out of five. But more than that, it was pretty heavy the first day of my was. Ours was a household in mourning. Somehow, Long about Christmas that passed. We do one thing, and I never had to order them to do it. We all gather at supper time and we bring something light to the table. It's a story, it's a joke, it's something that's our hearing ritual, and it has worked. And my family, my family has grown in love. And me too. Not leading the way, folks. No. I'm in, I'm trailing behind these three young women. And my wife, who has found the courage to go on making jokes and being herself, even if her hands and her feet don't work, even if she may never climb on another jet and fly to Cambodia or Bolivia. These things were dear to her. Oh, what a parade of former students have come to our house. It's well over 100, it may be 200. Seriously. And how wonderful 
that has been and how much it has restored hope to her. Now she is not a religious person. That's an understatement. <laughs> She's a professor who has believed in data and orthodoxy. And thorough preparation. <laughs> She's not like me at all. Um, things have changed. She asked me for a reading. I did it. It was basically a health reading. And I just put my heart in my pocket and shared it with her physician. And her physician said, I think I'll make this the basement of, basis of our treatment plan. I never thought that day would come. And I shared it with the acupuncturist who said something very similar. We're all on the same team. We've done a second reading since and it was equally well received. And this most may be the most astonishing thing of all. I've gone on doing readings at home, one or two a week. Nancy used to say, please find some place else to do those. They make me creepy. That's changed. She cooperates, and maybe the best part is, now my daughters conduct my readings. And this reading thing used to be dad's shtick. <laughs> well, I know myself that you cannot be with a channel and do a reading be touched and changed just by the way the atmosphere changes. I'm very happy. I didn't have to browbeat them. I didn't have to explain. I just saw that I couldn't round up a conductor and they stepped up and did it. It's a wonderful change. Well, I think we have an assignment to heal that earth in Syria. And I'd like you to close your eyes now and see it. It's so close to Jerusalem that you can stand in a tall building and see the mountains of Syria. Close enough, I hate to say it, that it doesn't take a very big piece of artillery to get a shell from Syria to Jerusalem. Let's heal that earth. Honestly, folks, it's rocks and sand. You won't see beautiful forests unless they've been planted and tended and irrigated. You will see beaches, but they're spare. See a people who have learned to make that earth blossom and support them for thousands of years. And see all those people whether we call them Arabs, or Jews, or Muslims, or whatever, and there are many other, quote, religions, unquote, in that area, many other, who have, for generations at a time, gotten along in peace and cooperated to make not just a life, but a lovely life on what, honestly, you would see as unforgiving ground. Let's bless that ground right now. Let's see the wounds in that earth heal. Let's see the blood that has been spilled transformed. Let's see the feet of the children walking that earth. They will. It won't be very long. And they'll walk that earth and run on that earth and they will laugh and play whether they're going home to a house or a tent. There will be a wave of souls that will gravitate to that place and heal that earth. I've been lucky enough to go to Vietnam and Cambodia in modern times. Those wars are over. Those children laugh and play and plan and grow up and marry and make families just like we do. Let's see that in Syria. Let's give our prayers in support of those souls who will come. Yes, let's pray for the earliest possible end 
to the combat. But let's pray for those who will come who will heal that land and those people. And in the process will be light bearers too. Let's see them even now in the tents of the refugee camps, whispering to those couples and saying, conceive me. I want to be with you in this situation. And I see by the smiles that some of you remember that experience in your own life. They do whisper before they come, don't they? Let's bless them. Let's call them. I don't know what their society will look like. I don't even know what our society is going to look like. But it's in God's hands, and there couldn't be better hands. We're going to be okay. It's in that light now. That's our blessing. We're going to be Okay. Thank you.